Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to all of you. Chamrip Sur, Teng Alkanir. Welcome to the CKS webinar series, and thank you so much for joining us. A quick note on who we are. The Center for Khmer Studies is a nonprofit organization that seeks to promote research and international scholarly exchange through programs that increase understanding of Cambodia and its region, strengthen Cambodia's cultural and educational structures, and integrate Cambodian scholars in both regional and international exchange. For today's webinar, we are thrilled to have Professor Miriam Stark from the University of Hawaii here with us to speak with you today. I will give a proper introduction to her in a moment, but first I'd like to give a few pointers about today's talk. The structure of today's program will be as follows. Following my introduction of Professor Stark, um, Professor Stark will, will speak for about 45 minutes or so, and that will then be followed by a 30 minute question and answer session. So one of the things that we ask you for the question and answer session is that you please put your questions, if you are on Zoom, in the question and answer box, the Q&A box on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, for those of you on Facebook Live, you can put your questions into the comments. Um, and we will get to them then at the, at, at the end of the talk then. Uh, so please note, this is important, that this event will be recorded and made available on our website and through our library. So turning now to our distinguished speaker, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Miriam Stark. Miriam, it's so wonderful to have you with us here today. Dr. Stark is a professor of anthropology at the University of Hawaii, and she is also currently the director of the University of Hawaii's Center for Southeast Asian Studies. For more than 25 years, Dr. Stark has co-directed archeological research projects in Cambodia in collaboration with Cambodia's Ministry of Culture, and Fine Arts, Apsara Authority, and the University of Fine Arts. Her research broadly focuses on the political economies and landscapes of Cambodia's deep history. Dr. Stark's numerous publications cover a wide range of topics, including early urbanism, residential patterns, state formation, material culture, cultural heritage and transmission and trade. Dr. Stark has collaborated on a variety of field research projects in Cambodia, including the Lower Mekong Archaeological Project, a more than decade long project that began in 1996. She's also worked together with the University of Sydney on a project called the Greater Angkor Project 3 on Angkorian and post Angkorian residential patterns. And recently, she has worked on the Khmer Production and Exchange Project with Ia Durit, among others a project that focuses on ancient ceramics and urbanism. At the heart of Dr. Stark's work is her persistent commitment to collaborate with Cambodian-based colleagues and maintain her longstanding productive relationship with Cambodia's Ministry of Culture. Her recent collaborations and multiple partners focus on the structure of urbanism and ceramic production in pre-modern times, topics that are relevant to her lecture today. So I now turn the floor over to Dr. Miriam Stark. Thank you very much, Eve, Dr. Zucker, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Let's see if I can give you a show. All right, can you see this? Uh, so uh, thank you to everyone who is listening now and to you future audience members uh, once this is recorded for taking the time to walk with me uh, through what I think is a very important topic in understanding Cambodia's deep history. I call the lecture Encore Urbanism and Political Economy, and I will take that apart and explain it uh, very soon. But first, I wanted to give thanks once more, um, because I have been very privileged to work in Cambodia since 1996, always through the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, frequently through the Royal University of Fine Arts, and more recently with Apsara National Authority. So all the work that we do, all the analyses we undertake, we do uh, under the guise of these units and also uh, through the kind permission of our colleagues. So thanks to them. And although uh, this gets pretty granular, uh, there are many, many, many people uh, who I need to thank and I can't thank by name in this talk, and specifically to say that archaeology is always a group effort. So I've had the great good fortune of working with more than 80 
interns, Khmer interns with um, several dozen colleagues at different levels and also people uh, who have been support staff in very important ways. Um, I also uh, have to emphasize that the work that I discussed today, which is uh, from Greater Encore Project 3, uh, was done in collaboration uh, with the Sydney team, but our own team uh, was comprised of Chai Rachna from Apsara National Authority, Heng P. Paul, who was then a PhD student at University of Hawaii, is now affiliated, and Alison Carter, who is now at the University of Oregon. So while I have some things to say, I want to give credit to them and point out that much of the research that we published could only be done in a group effort. So thank you to everyone for that. Now, I start with this Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which is arguably from the Delta, not from the Telnisap region, to ask for some help as we move forward with this talk and to point out that there are very long continuities in understanding the history of Cambodia and that when I approach the archaeological record, I do so also as a historian. So I'll start by giving you some context to the topics for today's talk. Then we'll talk about the place, which for most audience members is very familiar, but you might not have conceptualized it the way I do. Then I'll explain what I mean by urbanism and why it matters, and then we'll get to the issue of economy. So the context, that is, we're talking about what we could call pre-modern Southeast Asia, and specifically the lower Mekong Basin. Although later we think of Angkor as a place a named place named in inscriptions and probably referred to by people. For the period of time I'm talking about, it's much longer than that. And so we need to talk about the lower Mekong Basin. Then we'll talk about the history and scale of Angkorian urbanism. And then I'll uh, finish up there with Angkorian economy. So we all know uh, that Angkor and the Angkorian history and the lower Mekong Basin is in Southeast Asia. Um, but what we might not think about is that if we want to understand urbanism at Angkor, we have to think about urbanism also in Southeast Asia. This particular image, and I have a link to the source, shows you how many cities and how urbanized Southeast Asia is. So it's a very odd blend, particularly in China, it looks quite urbanized. And yet you have many countries in Southeast Asia where still the majority of the population today is rural. Uh, and here, of course, is Southeast Asia. So in 1950, that was the case broadly. And these dots, particularly the green dots, show you China and India, and Southeast Asia is here. So in 1950, there were not very many urban agglomerations. By 2000, you can see that China had become highly urban, and so had India, and also Indonesia. But still, much of Southeast Asia did not look so urban. Yet what we see since 2000 particularly is this burst of urbanism all over mainland Southeast Asia. And today, as one example, Ho Chi Minh City has 8.93 million residents. You also know personally that Phnom Penh has perhaps quadrupled in size in the last 25 years. So this is the kind of urbanization we're seeing broadly. And uh, archaeologists hope that some of what we study in the past can give us clues for what could happen in the future, because the future, as people forecast it for 2050, is a very urbanized Asia, including quite an urbanized Southeast Asia. So that's what I mean by urbanism. Now, I need to talk about context and time. Um, here we are. Uh, this is the area I've discussed. But the time scan is important. And uh, this is not a map I expect you to read. But what's important is that from a world history point of view, it's this block of time that starts really with the Roman Empire in the West and Han China, of course. And it goes all the way to the Mongols. So it's a very long period of time, almost 2000 years we're discussing, uh, where we see the earliest urbanism in mainland Southeast Asia, and we see the fluorescence of it. And then we see transformations through time. Now, the Mekong Basin is my frame of reference not just Cambodia, the boundaries of Cambodia have changed through time, but the Mekong Basin is a geographic unit and it doesn't change. And you can see it here in this map very clearly. It's a basin, it's the flat area, but you can see that it's not simply Cambodia, it's Northeast Thailand, it's Southern Vietnam. So it's no surprise that when the Angkorian Empire was at its height, it controlled much of the Mekong Basin. Um, the period, just the I use, uh, 
is mine. Uh, some people like to use it. Most people who work on Encore don't work as far back as what can be called the proto-historic. And most people who work on what can be called the proto-historic don't work in Cambodia, specifically on the pre-Encorean, Encorean or post-Encorean period. So we're talking about a period that starts at least 200 years before the common era and goes on, of course, until at least 14 or 1500 CE. Now, the Mekong world at that point where we start was a very busy place. It was not urban, but it was linked and it was networked. It was networked within Southeast Asia and it was networked from Southeast Asia uh, all the way north into the Han Empire. We have, as you probably know, uh, reports from Han emissaries. Uh, sorry, we have evidence from Han emissaries and Han armies moving into northern Vietnam and then some Centuries later, we have Chinese emissaries coming directly to the area that we think preceded Angkor, which we call Funan. Uh, but at the same time, we have this maritime silk road and route that took uh, travelers all the way along the coast of what is now India and uh, to Rome. So while we think about Funan or Angkor, they were never isolate. They were always part of greater networks and they have a very deep history. We have different sources for trying to understand this time period. Uh, more of you probably are familiar with historical sources, and I'm not saying that any of these specific sources uh, are 2000 years old. They would have been rewritten over the years as were Chinese sources. But we do have documentary sources for understanding the earliest period, uh, and those primarily come from the Chinese. We think there were early cities. Many archaeologists now are comfortable saying that. It's not simply Paul Wheatley, who many years ago suggested that just as China had very, very early urbanism, so you could see it in Southeast Asia. And uh, you may or may not be familiar with work at Angkor Bore in Takayo province, uh, which we believe from the work we've done and historians have done was one of several capitals of Funan. Um, you can see in this uh, map, which is from Jacques and Lafond from 2007, that whatever Funan was, there were settlements not only uh, in southern Cambodia, but in some parts also of southern Vietnam, perhaps in a whole arc here. So there was a notion of urbanism. There were aggregations of large sizes, and we think <clears throat> some templates that were established for what we would see later in time. So let's think about what is pre-modern Cambodia again. I show you this very same chronology just to keep us uh, on track. I was talking about the proto-historic period, but I'll spend most of my time talking about the Emporian period, which people are familiar with. I would only hasten to add that there is not one monolithic snapshot of the Angkorian period. This was a 600 year period of time. It was preceded by developments for centuries. And afterwards, we still see echoes of Angkor, as many scholars talk about. Uh, so it's not a static point in time. Things were changing. There were many rulers, several dozen we can talk about, and the dynamics would vary through time. But what did remain the same was that Mekong Basin. <laughs> so here's the Mekong Delta at the southern part of the basin, and here's the Tony Sap. But the basin continues uh, even further uh, to the north, and particularly to the northeast. So it's this entire area we'll talk about when we think about Angkor, not just the monuments and the beautiful Angkor archeological park, but the world, the Angkorian world in which those monuments were built and the rulers who commissioned those monuments ruled. Um, you know Angkor Wat or Vishnu Loka, and we'll spend most of our time thinking about the Angkorian world uh, from that vantage point. Now, there are many researchers who have done many studies uh, in the last 120 years, really, uh, and particularly in the last 75 years and then 25 years, where we use increasingly granular kinds of information. We go back sometimes to the same sources, but we find more technical ways to try and milk some information out of it. And so I start by trying to understand population hotspots, not only at Angkor, but in that Angkorian world. And I thank Eileen Lustig for her painstaking work for the last 15 or more years. Um, she used inscriptions here, that is the number of inscriptions and the, and the density of inscriptions to try to see where there might have been populations, both in the period that is the pre-Encorian and the Encorian period. And she draws here from work that was done, in fact, by even earlier people like Judith Jacob, 
uh, who talked about this back in the 1970s. But now we have more sophisticated ways to understand that by the pre anchorian period, what you see as the Anchorian world was well established in its core, and that is the Mekong Basin core. What we know, however, is that there were historical cycles, and I made this graphic, but what we see is a series of major and minor rulers through time, sometimes breaks, not such big breaks, but a few breaks. There was, of course, Cocair, uh, and we see periods that seem to be somewhat stable from one ruler to the next. So I've just presented this schematically to point out that, that again, this is not a monolithic 600 year period where nothing changed. There were radical changes, some of which uh, Briggs and a lot of the French colonial scholars talked about earlier. We know through all of it, however, that there were very similar notions of statecraft. This is, as you know, the Southern Gallery at Angkor Wat with the oath swearing to Surya Varman II. We know that uh, throughout most of the Angkorian period, power was pyramidal. I made this too. I don't know if there was really ever a conception of a pyramid, but that the ruler and the royal family and his inner elite were at the core. And then that the Angkorian world was populated by all of these different elites who had connections to the ruler uh, and who were very important in the operation of the state. At the bottom were commoners. We know the least about them, um, although I'll talk a little bit about what archaeology may tell you about those commoners later. And we know that wherever Angkor was, wherever the influence was, there was this mark of Angkor, right? We don't know about how powerful uh, Angkorian rule was in southern Laos. We don't know if we go to western Thailand today whether there was direct rule, but we know that all of these regions were part of this sphere. It was an ideological system. It was a culture. It was what archeologists refer to as a civilization. So that anywhere you go, you see very similar architecture. You see very similar statuary. <clears throat> you see the worship of very similar gods. And luckily for archeologists, you also see some very similar ceramics from place to place. So we think the whole area was networked. This is Tegan Hall's dissertation work where she's very interested in trying to understand connectivity through time. And so these lines just give you an idea that even though Angkor was at this center, that there were all kinds of connections. And I want to point out that they may have extended all the way to Prenakor or uh, to what's now called Ho Chi Minh City. And although we had these the capital and we had these centers, most of it looked more like this. It wasn't a very urban place. It was mostly a rural landscape. And this is the kind of landscape that scholars have been studying through the Greater Encore project and through Apsara for uh, some time now. Uh, and so what's interesting is trying to understand how on the one hand you can have a mega city and on the other hand you can have connections through largely rural landscapes that covered most of what we think of as the Angkorian world. Certainly there was connectedness and the connectedness was both riverine and it was also by roads. Um, in some cases, like Batambang province, which was very important for Angkor, uh, you could get there by water, but in other cases there were well-traveled routes. And archeologists can see these. I think that might be Mitch Hendrickson's hand there. It looks like his hand and he's in an ultralight plane flying along, looking at what is probably part of an ancient Angkorian road. So we have a large area with a focal point, which is that urban center of Angkor, provincial capitals whose rulers are linked to the capital, and we have a largely rural landscape. So how can we really talk about urbanism? <laughs> we can talk about urbanism because it looked so different in the capital. This is just one of many fine maps that Damien Evans and colleagues have created to try to understand the scale of Greater Encore, a term I believe Roland Fletcher uh, introduced. Um, what you see here and what Apsara now has in great detail is uh, a, a broad archeological map using remote sensing data to try to understand settlements and water features that were part of this general area. I, had, I, I hasten to point out, and uh, so would my colleagues, that this is an arbitrary boundary here on the west and also on the east. And uh, for those of you who have been working at Encore for a long time, 
you might remember that these are boundaries that I believe were set with the Zoning and Environmental Management Plan, the ZEMP, back in the 1990s um, when UNESCO was working to help Encore get back on its feet. So we anticipate, we expect, and we assume that settlement would have continued unabated both to the west and also to the southeast. But this is what we're talking about, this is what we're studying, and this is where we're going next. Now, with the advent of uh, all kinds of remote sensing data, and people particularly like looking at LIDAR data, we know more about where people may have lived. I must also add that although LIDAR produces beautiful photographs, the most effective uses of LIDAR come in using LIDAR in areas where there's also been sustained field-based excavation and survey work done by archaeologists. A classic case of that is Angkor Thom. So here's a beautiful LIDAR. You can see what it looks like within the walled city. If you cross your eyes carefully, you may be able to see a series, just many hundreds of small ponds here. And there's actually a grid like, sorry, there's, um, excuse me, there's a grid like pattern, which is harder to see, uh, but it's orthogonal. And I'm moving my cursor here so that you can see that actually it's uh, more clear than you'd think. It started on an axial system. And, uh, and then it gets filled in. So we see all this, but one reason why we know all this is not just LIDAR, it's because Jacques Rocher of the Ecole Francaise d'Extremorient has had a very long uh, field-based campaign in Angkor Thom. And so he's able to produce maps that we can match to the LIDAR. So archeology span works best when you combine remote sensing data of different kinds with what we call ground truthing. Um, this is just what National Geographic thinks Angkor Thom looked like at the time. You can see that there are very few details here in the middle. But what's important to remember is that at that time, which is the apex of Angkorian urbanism, uh, it's quite possible that only part of the capital was within Angkor Thom. It is probably the part that Joe Duc Wan described in 1296 during his visit. But still, uh, we think that there would have been surrounding populations uh, for the in, almost the entire geographic extent of this image, actually. And much of it would have been organized uh, it, with some distance from those temple complexes, much like uh, the countryside. The urban population, however, became quite dense. And uh, there have recently been some very important publications about Angkorian urbanism based on at least five decades of work. We could actually take it all the way back to um, some of the French who were flying uh, and making aerial photographs in the 1930s of the area. Uh, and then, of course, Christophe Poitier did very important work for his dissertation, Damien's work uh, for his dissertation, and Sarah Claussen's work for her dissertation, many dissertations. Uh, have contributed to us being able to model population for this core area here, um, which you can see, which we think of as the epicenter. So there have been three or four articles, and all I'm going to do is summarize this work. And I need to give credit particularly to Sarah Klassen for synthesizing it and leading the team in publishing some of this work. That map I showed you, which was the ZEMP map which had all kinds of dots on it. It took 25 years, I think, to develop this, maybe more than 25 years. Those dots all had to be visited. And we did that through the Greater Encore Project, different team members did, and through different dissertations. And after visiting them, they had to be dated. So this is the best guess from Sarah and Damien's 2020 article of the age of all of these temples and prasats in the greater Angkor core, right? So what you see are the very light yellow ones, which would be pre-Angkorian. And it's quite clear actually that the physical extent on this map of pre-Angkorian prasats maps what we see later on. Then you see different periods of time, particularly as you get more orange, and then you're moving into the 10th and 11th centuries. So although we think of the apex of the Angkorian state as being really with Jayavarman VII, and in the 12th century, it turns out that most of the settlement 
uh, was at least started before then. It's a very important point to make. Uh, we did, we think, see a big influx of population during Jayavarm in the seventh reign, based on the work that Sarah has done with Damien and others. Uh, but we also see that the entire area had been mapped out much earlier. This is a little bit complicated to understand, but if you look at point density, which is the darker the color through time, you can see what I mean. So uh, you have Hariharalaya and you also have this uh, point density that is uh, before the Anchorian period and the pre-Anchorian period. As soon as we have the start of the Anchorian period, you start to see the spread all over this greater Angkor region uh, with the establishment of Prasat, which we think are individual communities uh, linked or anchored by shrines. By a thousand, you start to see a hot spot here. Um, and by 1100, things get very busy. And finally, the time that we think of 1200 CE as being Jayavarma the seventh, up until somewhere around 1300, this, this period of the, the peak of the empire, you see that there is certainly more population, uh, but in some ways you could already predict it from uh, what had been in place 200 years before. So what's important here is that you can see a series of developments where populations come in, they establish villages, and then the villages grow. Now, the estimated population, which Bernard Philippe Grolier gave in his 1979 article, he said maybe it could be a million people at its peak. It turns out that after <laughs> more than 30 years of work since Grolier, fine grained work involving thousands of hours of field work by dozens of archaeologists and laborers, we come up with numbers that aren't entirely off from him, 700 to 900,000, but for a short period of time, relatively speaking. So what's interesting about the work that uh, Sarah Klassen has led and, uh, and Allison Carter has worked on quite a bit as well, is that you have quite, you have dynamism through time. So you have growth in different parts of the capital region and you have different peaks in how areas are used. That's important to know that it wasn't just a capital where 900,000 people moved in at 900 CE and stayed there. It actually had much more dynamism to it. And one reason it had so much dynamism, of course, is because there was this history of different rulers, some of which were more expansionist than others, right? So you have the movement of people out and you have the movement of people like these prisoners in to what becomes the Ancorian world. Now, you can look at urbanism then in this macro perspective by trying to model population, but what are the components of urbanism? What does it look like on the ground? Where did people live and how did they use different parts of their capital? We spent about eight or nine years and five years of field work just focusing on residential patterning in two different kinds of Angkorian spaces in Greater Angkor. And the first one, and the one that's most compelling to most people, is our work in temple enclosures. Angkor Wat is the most iconic temple in some ways. Thank you to Damien for this very nice graphic. You can take all of those trees off, and this is what it looks like if you use LIDAR underneath it. And we spent quite a long time trying to understand who was living in these spaces here and in these spaces here. And we published on it quite a bit. And we work also with historians and with their interpretations to try to understand different kinds of populations who would have lived in the capital. Archaeologists use the term attached specialists to describe populations in a state like Angkor whose sole occupation would be linked to supporting the state. And we think that probably most people who lived within this temple enclosure were those kinds of people, whether or not they moved in and out on a two week basis is a matter of some speculation, although there are some epigraphic suggestions this might be the case, uh, but there would have been thousands of people needed in order just to support the temple. And as we talk about in our publications, not only were there the priests and the dancers, not only were there the builders at the beginning, 
but there were janitors and there were people who had to bring flowers and there were cooks and there were landscapers and maybe we don't know what these are maybe there were gardeners and there would have been cowboys and cow herds in general to take care of the cows because of the products they needed and perhaps some other goods also were grown locally in this region and not only transported in from the provinces so as an urban living space Angkor was very busy. Now, whether it looked specifically like this reconstruction that Tom Hyam has made, sorry, Tom Chandler has made here, we're not sure. Our excavations, and this is a photograph from 2015, thanks to Allison Carter, suggest that indeed people were living in this area. And just like Angkor Tom later, there was a grid and residential patterning was organized on the grid. In Angkor Thom, it was a nine kilometer by nine kilometer grid. And in Angkor Wat, it was much smaller, but we estimate that there could have easily been 4,000 people who were living in here to maintain it during its period of peak usage. Now, what can we find out about, uh, about Angkor really by also consulting documentary records? Um, to understand economy, we have to start there actually, because uh, although we don't have records like Mesopotamian accounting records, we do have some suggestions, particularly in the Khmer components of the inscriptions of the kinds of goods that moved across the landscape. <clears throat> we have at least 1300 pre angkorian and Angkorian inscriptions. And I wanted to give a thanks to AFAO, which is making uh, the content of these inscriptions now available on a digital database. We have archeological research to tell us about goods. Uh, and we also have models that uh, we can apply to try to understand the nature of the economy. One point that we can't ever lose track of really is that Angkor, its political structure was quite hierarchical. So this knowledge of hierarchy uh, is both important, but there's also a cautionary tale here, which is that for all of the representations of these gods, sorry, of these kings as gods, for all of the references to them as gods, and for all of the efforts to try to equate them with gods in their conduct, we don't know honestly how much effective economic power they yielded beyond the capital. Now it was a very big capital, but it still was uh, only one part of the greater Angkorian world. We know that religion and state mattered and we know that uh, everywhere that we see the mark of Angkor, we also see Angkorian religion and that worshiping the king was intrinsic to that religion. But when we try to think about economic and political control, we have to disarticulate that from religion and state. So Eileen Lustig, again, working with inscriptions, did this very interesting study where she looked at the number of inscriptions, royal inscriptions, non-royal inscriptions, and inscriptions that specifically mention Rajakadia, the state officials who were sent out to the provinces to administer for the state. What she sees is that uh, the farther you go from the metropolitan area, which is within 50 kilometers here, the fewer the inscriptions that are royal inscriptions. In fact, they drop off to almost nothing. And that's also the case for the state officials, which could suggest that the limit of effective control was perhaps not much more than the core capital area of a 25 to 50 square kilometer radius from Angkor. If that's the case politically, then it might also be the case economically. Another way to look at it could be the geographic regions under different Angkorian rulers. And Mitch Hendrickson's work here has been very important by looking at roads and rivers and temples. So what he did in this 2012 article is try to understand not only where the capital was, but where the linking points were, the, the most distant linking points by which a ruler would reckon the area of control. So Jayavarman II was very important, but you can see that his effective area of control was not so large compared, of course, to Suryavarman I, who expanded into uh, Thailand, expanded west. And that it 
once expanded, didn't guarantee that the successive ruler would then have that same control because you can see that Dara Rindra Barman here had a very small amount of effective control as defined by roads that were used and relationships and references from temples in areas that weren't Angkor. So it varied through time from Jaya Varman in the ninth century and uh, through the 12th century uh, as well. We can take Jaya Varman, we can look at Yaso Varman and take it all the way. Rajendra Varman was a pretty important ruler. Uh, uh, and so of course was Jaya Varman V. And then you have this contraction with Udaya Ditya Varman that then gets larger and gets slightly smaller and gets smaller again and smaller again and so on. So you see that it changes through time. The areas that were under Angkorian rulers are the areas that were most likely to be under direct economic control as well. Um, and it's important to point out that these Visaya or Praman, the, the provinces, could be very powerful. According to uh, Hedwige Mulzer Olnachten, and I hope I didn't mispronounce her name, this is how big the Angkorian world could have been with Jayavarman VII. Perhaps, right? But what does that mean that it's that big? And how was it linked together besides between the provincial elites and the capital? That's what interests us in trying to understand the Angkorian economy, which is where I turn next. And I'm going to talk very briefly about agrarian foundations. That is the farming that produced the surplus that allowed people to build their temples and to live well, and also craft production. Now by agrarian foundations, we have to talk about rice. Rice was the primary domesticate and it was also the most important taxation commodity. It is listed uh, in temple records and it's suggested that although perhaps distant provinces didn't ship rice all the way to Angkor, there was a conversion system where rice was converted into more valuable goods. And finally, what was moved into the Angkorian core may have been more, um, preciosities like silver and gold and uh, certain kinds of uh, spices and aromatic woods and, uh, and goods that were needed, perhaps even sesame oil, things like that. It depends on where you look in the inscriptions. But we do know that even in the core that there would have been potential for great surplus. The Tony Sap hydrology is ideal for growing multiple kinds of crops. And as early as the third century CE, the Chinese who visited Funan said that they actually had two to three crops a year. So the whole Mekong Basin was a, tre a tremendously uh, rich place to grow rice. Uh, and for what it's worth, 90% of 20th century Cambodian agriculture was based on rain-fed farming, by which I mean, you don't need to irrigate with irrigation canals, right? That's what made the Mekong Basin so beautiful. And it's a point that multiple sequential geographers have pointed out. What makes Cambodia beautiful is how much you can do without the irrigation canals. You can bund your pond fields, you can use flood recession, you can use floating rice. And in fact, even as late as the 1950s and 60s, Khmer's were using all of these methods. It's only uh, much more recently that canal fed irrigation systems have come into play. Now, what those fields look like in the Angkorian world, we don't know exactly. This uh, photograph shows you both the fields today, which you can see here, and they're rectangles, probably from the 1970s, and superimposed on there using different kinds of remote sensing data, particularly AirSAR data. Uh, Scott Hawken and his colleagues have been able to infer these kinds of fields that may have underlain uh, what we see today and that seem to surround different settlements that would have also had prasad. So in the larger settlements, you had temples. So here you have Banti Sarai, of course, uh, but you also had temples in smaller areas, right? So the entire world that was greater Angkor, that greater metropolitan area, would have been modular in a sense that different small communities focused on their prasats and their shrines and they may have been grouped into larger communities that had larger temples, and all of them were focused on the state temples. I'm not making that up, by the way. There is epigraphic uh, information that suggests that could be the temple economy structure as early as perhaps the pre-Ancorian period, 
Hang Pi Paul has done very important work with the inscriptions to try to understand what pre Angkorian political economy looked like, particularly in the middle Mekong area of Cambodia. And you can see based on inscriptions that there would have been these networks of local temples that were responsible to provincial temples that then were responsible to the Angkorian state. Well, how did this work? Partly by taxes, we think, and the taxes would have involved rice. And this is the system I was talking about. I just have a nice picture of blended fields on the bottom there, but they were very productive, like I said, without the need to install major irrigation. So all through the Mekong Basin, there would have been ample rice growing regions. We know that some areas were more arable than others. The Mekong Delta was phenomenally rich, and of course, so was Batambang. <clears throat> but other areas were also very productive and uh, have remained so actually into the 21st century. So we know about taxes, that's what the historians say. And as I said, the taxes may have started in rice, but then they would have been converted into the kinds of goods that the state wanted, whether those goods were uh, metal, precious metal, and this is silver, whether they were textiles, whether they were certain kinds of goods like cardamom pods, whether they were aromatic woods or sometimes different kinds of livestock and their products. We also know that Angkor had a non-monetized economy. Um, it is the case that there was gold. We not only think there was gold and put it on our reconstructions as you see here, but there's actual gold that's been found and some of it's finally been repatriated to Cambodia uh, because so much of it was lost in the illicit antiquities traffic market. We also know from inscriptions that corvée labor, that is a certain amount of uh, time every year, uh, was required from different communities to work for the state. This is not uncommon in ancient states. The Inca, for example, had corvée labor. We think the Egyptians built their pyramids with corvée labor. So you had physical taxes and you had labor as taxes. Uh, and we know from the inscriptions that that was integral to the Angkorian state. What we also know is there must have been an awful lot of it. Now, this is a hard set of graphics to look at. Sorry, this is Mitch Hendrickson and Stephanie Leroy. Um, but basically what they're trying to argue here is that at different points in time, different population sizes were required to invest that corvée labor to build for the state. Right. And so what you see is that in, uh, in the early period, in the 900s and the 1000s and the 1100s, with a few exceptions here, uh, there weren't that many large state temples. But by the time that you get to the 11th and 12th century, which is where you see the construction of uh, Angkor Wat and of course all of the Jayavarman temples, you see a surge in demand not only do you see that, you see a shift in the kind of raw material that's needed. So if I walk you carefully through this graphic on the bottom, there are three kinds of raw material that are used. Bricks. So here you see that in the early ninth century, many of the monuments were made of brick. And that was echoing what was uh, happening in the pre ancorian period. But you see that the amount of blue goes down through time and the amount of uh, let's see, this is laterite. You see that gray starts to show up. So you have the beginning of sandstone architecture being very significant, uh, certainly by the ninth and early 10th century and, uh, and even laterite, uh, which is a strange building material. Um, but it was, only, it was more important in some of the provinces than in the capital. And then you have this shift where you have that burst of more labor requirements to build temples you also have a shift to sandstone, which is quite labor intensive. Well, what did the architecture look like? Most of you know, and all of you surely have visited. Um, we worked at Taprom as part of our work uh, in uh, the Greater Angkor Project. This is just an example of some of the excavation units that we excavated. And we tried very diligently to uh, engage in non-invasive excavation. So we didn't strip big areas, but we were able through our work in uh, 2012, 2014, to sample enough areas to really understand what this LIDAR looks like, right? So here is Taprom itself, and we worked in areas uh, over here, 
we worked in areas over here, we worked in over areas over here. And what you can see are with the numbers, there are linear mounds, there are mound pond grid patterns again on that orthogonal grid. And then you also have at Taprom, maybe you have multi shaped mound, pound, mound ponds here where maybe there was a garden area. So that's what we can see archaeologically. Now, the reason we worked at Taprom is that there is literally an inscription, which George Sedez translated and published in 1906, of what was there. So on the stela, it says that within those grounds, there must have been 12,000 people who lived there, right? There were the high priests, there were the dancers, there were the learned men or professors, because of course it was a university, uh, and there were students and officials and so on. But more than that, it points out that there were tens of thousands, maybe 66,000 people living in thousands of little settlements who had to provide services for the temple. So we try to combine both archeological work with documentary evidence to understand residential patterning. That's part of the work we've done. And the other work that we've done, not just the team I'm on with the Khmer Production and Exchange, but several teams, including Apsara archeologists doing their own work as well, have looked at the economy. So there are these materials that were very important for the Angkorian Empire. Um, I only talk about two here <clears throat> because, uh, because of time limitations and also because for all of the time and labor that archaeologists have invested in working around Angkor, it's so vast that we really are just beginning to scratch the surface of what we know. But one thing archaeologists like are pots. So here's some pots, and I thank Chai Rachna for this. On the other thing archaeologists really like are metal, if we can find it. This is architectural iron. And it's important as crampons, uh, although as you know, Angkorian sandstone temples didn't have mortar, they were held together in many cases with these crampons. So I'm gonna talk about uh, how the state temples, creating them and maintaining them was a kind of, created a kind of economic demand. So they're public works and they're vast, and they would have required a great deal of labor, both at the beginning, of course, but also throughout their lifespan. Again, when Mitch and Stephanie were working on temple material, I pointed out that the demands got larger through time, right? So if you see the brick, the brick temples disappear by the end of the mid 10th century, by the late 10th century, we have no more. And then we have a shift to sandstone. And sandstone is a very difficult building material. It's beautiful, it's durable, and it's hard to work with. You have to mine it, you have to quarry it, you have to move it, and then somehow you need to adhere it together so that you can create these very large, uh, these very large structures that won't fall down. So for many years, uh, Mitch Hendrickson and uh, a team, including Pong Kasaka and others, had been working on a series of different projects based at uh, Preyakon of Kampong Svai to try to understand what this complex looked like. I should also point out that there are Apsara and other Khmer archaeologists who are working on iron production as well, and we're still identifying new sites. But let's go back to that top Rome inscription, because that's where we worked. And even in that inscription, it mentions that there were approximately 114 tons of iron required to build that temple. Well, where did this iron come from? It wasn't from the immediate environs of Angkor. But if you go out to Preyakon of Kampong Svai, go back here, you see here is Angkor, and you take a road out to there, one of the larger Angkorian temples, perhaps the largest Angkorian temple complex in the entire Angkorian world, you need not go far to go to Phnom Dyke. And in Phnom Dyke, which as you know, means the hills of iron, you definitely have iron. And here is for scale, someone who's standing by this hill. And it's a hill of slag. So it's a hill that's created by the, uh, um, of the off products of smelting iron, of, of melting iron and producing iron. And we think that iron for many scientific reasons moved to Angkor. So this is one of many ongoing uh, projects that we know something about, uh, but that hopefully in the next 20 years, we'll learn much more. It's quite possible there were other areas where, where iron was also uh, mined and quarried, but this, as far as we know, is the one where you have very clear evidence of a road. 
There were many kinds of public works. You're familiar with the reservoirs or the barai. In this case, you have not only the construction of the reservoirs, but you have a temple in the middle of it. And the hallmark of the Angkorian state was to create these kinds of state features. So what was visible of Angkor was what you could see. But I should point out that as beautiful as this is, and I have to thank Roland Fletcher for sharing this picture by someone Clark, the pottery was also very important. And that's where we come in. Not when I say we, not just me and not just the Khmer Production and Exchange Project, but perhaps 15 different Khmer and foreign archeologists have been working on excavating kilns, including Japanese archeologists for more than 30 years. Um, well, we know that Etienne et Monnier talked first about the kilns on Phnom Kulen. We now know there were kilns in many different places. I show you this picture just because uh, these are very nice photographs of uh, images of some of the earlier uh, green glazed wares, but you can see some brown glazed wares too. Um, they tell us different kinds of things about the Khmer state. They certainly are associated with uh, Khmer influence and they may have been Khmer elite goods, but they tell us different kinds of messages than the temples themselves, because you can find broken pieces of ceramics all over the landscape in a much bigger area than you find your temples. So where are these kilns? Well, they're all over the place. Um, I should point out that also Thai archeologists have been working up in Thailand. In fact, some of the earliest systematic excavations were in Bori Ram by Thai archeologists uh, through the Thai Fine Arts Department. Much work has been done in and around Greater Angkor of the people who've dedicated uh, their dissertations and much of their life research to it. Of course, Ia Dorit, uh, also Tin Tina, Chai Rachna, uh, so there are others as well. And uh, Fon Kaseka has worked for many years down here at Chiang This is just a map of what we know today. And as I said, the ceramics are everywhere. We fully anticipate that we will find more kilns in the Angkorian world. And they may be in many places, including south of this Tolmi Sat. It's quite possible. So we're just at the very beginning of our work, uh, but I can tell you that through using geochemistry and studying the, the recipes of how these pots were made, we're beginning to be able to map out which kilns were important at what points in time. And uh, that's baseline information for future researchers who want to understand connectedness between different parts of the Angkorian world. So when I talk about the political economy of Angkorian urbanism, and I'm wrapping up here, you have to understand these three integrated components. One is urbanism. What did it look like? And where was Angkor urban? And we think that Angkor was really only urban at the banks of the Tomi Sap. This was a occasionally highly densely urban area and always thickly populated area. And within it, we assume there was a great deal of production and control over production. What we don't know is the degree to which goods created outside of this area moved into the capital. And what we also don't know is to what extent the state actually controlled production. Jodak Wan, again, in a little snapshot in 1296, talked about markets and the importance of markets and goods that moved into markets. Now, of course, we would like it if Jodak Wan had given us some lists of the goods and who was selling them, uh, but, we don't, but we do know that there was some autonomous or independent economic work at the same time. So understanding urbanism requires us to understand production and all of that requires us to investigate mechanisms of control. We're really just at the beginning of a new chapter of Angkorian studies. I feel very grateful that I've been able to be in and not the groundwork because that was done by the French, but in this very productive period of time. And I hope that our teams can continue working for decades. Um, but we also know and hope at least that 60 years from now or 100 years from now, someone talking about Angkor will have a completely different and much more detailed understanding of what it looked like using archeological evidence. I wanted to thank Apsara, National Authority and the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts for allowing us to work in Cambodia and a number of funding agencies that have supported our work, including the Australian Research Council, National Science Foundation, Wenner Gren, National Endowment for the Humanities, 
and also the National Geographic Society. And finally, thank you very much to the Center for Khmer Studies, not only for asking me to speak today, I see I've given maybe four or five lectures at CKS over the years, and it's funded some of my earlier work in Southern Cambodia, but really for all of the good work it does to support our broader community. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miriam, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> and it's very exciting to see that there's so many new discoveries being made and the pieces are starting to come together. Um, so just quickly before I, I start the question and answer here, just a reminder to everyone, um, please put your questions in the Q&A if you're on Zoom uh, so I can see them and deliver them to Miriam. Um, so, and if you are on Facebook, then please put them in the comments chat section and um, they will be shared. So, um, so just to start off, uh, there's a few questions, oh, three questions, namely from, from Courtney um, for you. And they, some of them came up earlier in the talk. So we're kind of going back a little bit to the earlier part of the talk for them. And I, I'll just ask you the three of them at once and then you can decide for yourself how, what order you'd like to answer them in. And um, then we have some other questions after that. Um, so Courtney says, um, Miriam, great talk. Could you please share the link to the urbanism uh, in the Southeast Asia map that you shared? I couldn't get access to it. So if you, Sorry. and you obviously we, maybe we could follow with that later. Um, yes. And then secondly, your pyramid graph is a bit human centered. I think there is evidence <laughs> of an important element of non-human power also in this civilization. Can you speak to the evidence that we have been, uh, that we have attesting to this often silenced uh, non-human element of civilizational hierarchy? And thirdly, um, the villages you show in the Angkor region in 800 CE, does this evidence show settlements in areas that were previously not settled by humans? Or do we see rulers with Brasat moving? Sorry, whoops, with Brasat, my screen just shifted, sorry. Um, or do we see rulers with Brasat moving into areas that were already settled? If we don't know, what work would need to be done to determine the human settlement pattern in the area before the Brasat arrives? Thank you, Courtney. You have a lot of questions. First of all, I just loaded a link to the Cambodian Archaeological LIDAR Initiative, which is one place where I'm pretty sure you can find different maps. Um, this is Damien Evans' project, and uh, I believe that since his work has been done by the, uh, with funding from the European Research Council, he has a lot of open access articles there um, under publications. And in the publications, you can see the maps. So, uh, let's see if you, uh, I'm not sure, I would have to look and see how many of them, ah, yes. So uh, in many cases, if you go to the publication link, which I'll put here, um, so here, let me put it in. There's the publication link, and actually it's the, for people who aren't going to see the chat box, the URL is a is Angkor LIDAR, A-N-G-K-O-R-L-I-D-A-R.org. So AngkorLIDAR.org. And then from there, you can go to publications and you can click on a lot of them. So that might be helpful. Um, and Damien also is willing to share those maps. That's number one. Number two, yeah, I agree that uh, there's a lot of non-human settlement. And I think what you're getting back to is... Um, the notion of these different kinds of spirits, not, not just animals, but of uh, spirits that populate the landscape, which of course, anyone working in Cambodia is very aware of that. Uh, when I worked at Angkor Burai for a long time, and then we did a survey uh, up and down the Takayo River, which is a drainage of the Basak, which is a drainage of the Mekong. We found a really uncanny relationship between brick vestiges and Ktomnekta. So everywhere almost that we saw evidence of an ancient Prasat, we saw Ktomnekta. And we talked with people in many dozens of villages about these remnants of these brick structures. 
and what we learned from them is that the areas were sacred. So my first response is, I can't tell you the answer because you can't find it archaeologically. But the second one is that I would reckon that anywhere you saw a prasat, it was sacred before there was a prasat. Um, and also, I would point out that at least in Takayo, uh, most pagodas that I visited uh, had Tomnekta very close by, definitely at Angkor Wai. So, so this notion of spirits um, and a, a non-human world is, is really important. But I, I have to say, archaeologists are in a terrible position to try to find this because we're, we're vulgar materialists. So we're best when we can work with things and objects and materials. And this sort of sacred world is so non-material and it, it's, it is materialized, but not in ways that archeologists can know, right? So all we can do is talk to people today and then we can extrapolate backwards and uh, we're not very comfortable doing that. So I think that answers your second question, uh, or at least I could, conclude by saying, I think that the Angkorian world was defined by non-human spirits, in fact, um, and that when you see the development of these shrines, those were ways to commemorate or recognize them. Also, of course, the early statues that we see, the very beautiful ones, including the first Bodhisattva Lokateshvara I showed you, likely were viewed as homes for spirits, right? Because there were already nectar of all kinds. So, so it's a very easy translation. They're very beautiful, these statues. And so why not live in a beautiful home? So I don't think you can pull it apart. And I don't think archaeologists can answer your question. Now, the third question, I think, was about the location of these pre ancorian sites, right? Is that right, Eve? Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. So I'll just, I, I can just read it to you again. Um, the villages you show in the Angkor region in 800, does, does the evidence show settlements in areas that were previously not settled by humans? Or do we see rulers with Brasat moving into areas that were already settled? If we don't know, what work would need to be done to determine the human settlement pattern in the area before the Brasat arrives? So, uh, thank you. So again, archaeologists are a little limited. Um, and the LIDAR work is phenomenal. Uh, but you have to go in and excavate. So between the work that um, actually Christophe Fortier also did work in the Angkor area, Pipal, uh, in the Talaborivat area, us down in the Delta, um, what we're finding is that most pre-Angkorian sites that we test have a proto-historic component underneath it. So LIDAR is great and inscriptions are great but we won't know whether there was pre-existing settlement until we get in there and excavate. And every place is different. So for example, when we worked at Angkor Wat, there was a very clear starting point, right? We could see uh, a layer, we could see a sterile layer of soil, we call it. And then we could see all of these sandstone chips, which officer archeologists putting in the bathroom assured me they had worked before. Sometimes the sandstone chip layer was 75 centimeters thick. It was very thick, very deep, because uh, the architects would move all of the sandstone to the site, and then they would build the building, and then they had people go in and do the final decorations. N not probably for the lintels, but for other parts of the site. Um, so, but then at Taprom, we found that we had an earlier occupation that could go back to the seventh century, and we excavated another place. That, uh, which is uh, kind of near Prey Roop, we call it Kokpano, and there we have a different settlement history. So every place has a different settlement history. And if you look on a LIDAR map or an aerial photograph, you can't see that. You see what we call a palimpsest. So some work needs to be done in order to get underneath and see when it all started. And for us, it's been extremely useful also to use scientific dating. So we look at Chinese ceramics and so on, but we also use radiocarbon dates and different kinds of dating techniques to understand it. Um, so I can't answer your question about whether uh, these areas had already been occupied and, and rulers came in and took them over, whether they were established by the rulers. I would say that we feel pretty comfortable saying that there were a smaller number of less powerful rulers in the pre-encoding period, right? 
So, but there were elites. We know that there were elites all over. So what happens is you have this kind of qualitative change in the structure of power and in the reach of power. I hope that helps. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I, the next two questions I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna give them to you both at once because they both have to do with the building. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> here's, we're back to the tangible, very tangible world here. Um, so the first from Sibore is, is, is asking about those iron rods that you discussed in the building yeah. and yeah. wanted to know whether they were cased into the rocks joint on the site. And I'll just give you the second question as well. Um, okay which is from Jennifer, which is, what were the reasons to switch to the building materials from brick to laterite to stand, sandstone other than uh, aestheticism of the periods? Any inscriptions regarding this? Can you see the picture now of the sandstone again? Do we see the Prasat Hin? Yes, um, Panamurum and Buriram, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, the questions are about whether they were encased. So it's, it's a little hard to see here. Um, this is one block, this is another block, and then the iron would be put in between them. And you can see there were different shapes, I understand from Mitch Hendrickson, I am no specialist on these crampons, they're called crampons. There are different kinds, but some of them would be shaped like this. And I think before that, maybe I had, oh gosh, I don't remember where my other picture is. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just confusing you. Let's go here. There are different kinds of crampons. Some look more like a, like a clip and others are these eye-shaped things. Um, so they would, they would be put, and I'm not sure if this is answering you, as they were building. So the, the sandstone blocks would be moved. Uh, they, would, they would be quarried and made into rough, rough outs. They would be moved. I think they're finished on site based on the sandstone chips and then they would be assembled. And at that point, that's where to assemble them, you would have to then do further sculpting so that you could create the, the grooves to put in the crampons. Does that, maybe that answers? Um, and then the second question, which had to do with why did they stop building in brick and why did they start with sandstone? We won't know that, that's about as hard to answer as Courtney's question about the non-human world, but, um, I would imagine what archaeologists would suggest is that common among states, non-core could be like this, it's common that as states grow, um, there are efforts to invest more and more value in state products. And so brick is nice, but it's not as valuable. It's not as hard to get, right, as sandstone, and it's not as hard to work with. Also, it melts. I think the melting was probably a little bit of a problem too, but, but the good thing about sandstone and laterite also is that, um, is first of all, that it, it is more durable. It's, it's more expensive. You have to have a huge labor force to get it. And it's also a nice medium if you decide that you're going to put bar reliefs on something. So if you had the chance to go to Samba Prey Cook, you can see that actually there are something like bas reliefs in the brick architecture there. They're a little hard to see. They probably would have been plastered, but there's nothing as extraordinary as looking at the kind of really detailed stone carving that you have. Uh, and you can see it a little bit in this Prasat Hen Penang Room here on the left. Um, there are remarkable accounts of uh, stone workers and, and really guilds of stone workers in South India, not coming to Angkor, but a comparable kind of thing at, at roughly the same time working in temples. Um, and this was the work of a lifetime, right? So the shift to sandstone created a different medium for decoration. It signaled more power, it required more people, and uh, in many ways just uh, reflected uh, a consolidation of, of the ability to rule over a group, so the state is growing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, we've got a few more questions here. Um, this is from Matthew, um, who's asking whether there's much evidence of tribal and or non-Khmer people living in the basin. Right. Yeah. Well, if it's Matthew, who I think it is, then then he's also read Jodak One, and you know, there's some references to slaves that are from the mountains. Um, but we, right? We don't know, right? We have, and the problem is, we just have this this one Chinese documentary source. We have 
thousands or at least over a thousand inscriptions, but the inscriptions are not ethnography and um, the kinds of questions that we ask as anthropological archaeologists are ethnographic, so we're interested in this. It's conceivable that, you know, 40 years down the road, if there are another 60 archaeologists who are doing work, that the work will get as fine grained as uh, places like Mesoamerica or perhaps even the American Southwest where, and parts of Europe where people's knowledge of ceramics and material culture will become so detailed that they'll be able to identify differences that you can see within settlements in the kinds of goods that are used, not just where the Chinese ceramics are, but different manufacturing traditions and different raw materials, right? So working in other areas, particularly in historical archaeology, um, archaeologists in the last 30 years have been able, for example, working on plantations in the United States, in the southern United States, to identify slavery, pottery. This was new. No one had ever looked for it before. And it used to be called colono wear, but some of the vessel forms, uh, the, the vessel forms, the raw materials and the functions are very different from other pottery found there, right? So it's possible in some cases now to identify areas that would have been used by slaves versus, and definitely by Native Americans and by Alaskan natives uh, in uh, areas on the uh, West Coast, like, um, like some Russian forts that some people have worked at before. We don't have that level of detail. We need to do much, much more work. And one of the challenges is that uh, we're still working at the temple level and the city level. And in order to understand and identify, even if it's possible, um, different groups within settlements, we would have to work at the settlement and household level. And that's a big challenge. I mean, we've been trying to do household archeology span in Cambodia and it's, it's really, uh, hard to do. Uh, almost no one does it in Southeast Asia. This is very hard to do. Most people like to dig burials uh, or some people do mostly remote sensing work. So that scale is very difficult, but it's possible eventually that uh, people would develop enough expertise and knowledge in areas uh, of expertise of the archeological record and knowledge of the variability that they would be able to see those kinds of fine grain differences. At this point, we can't talk about it much, sorry. So there's a couple questions that are that are somewhat connected um, to each other. So um, I'll read them both out to you because I think that there's a common connection between the two of them. One's from our Facebook uh, chat, um, and it says you mentioned that the epicenter of Angkor has a population of close to one million. Is there a similar population estimate estimation for the provincial centers? A comparison would be interesting to see how prevalent urban primacy was historically. And so that's more of a local area Cambodia one. Um, but then the second one is greetings from Jakarta. Oh. Wonderful presentation, Miriam. This is from Mira. Um, I read that Angkor once was the world's biggest pre-industrial city together with Tikal in Guatemala. What do you think the importance of Angkor in shaping the Southeast Asian, in shaping Southeast Asian urbanism, or even in a larger context? Thank you. Oh, that's great. Okay, so first of all, from Aron Sakada, um, we here's the problem: we need ten times as many archaeologists. So when I say that it's taken really fifty years to model population in Angkor, and this is very gross modeling, it might be nine hundred thousand, might be seven hundred thousand. Uh, we know nothing about the provincial areas. In fact, some of the provinces, we only know their temples. We don't know about where people live. So uh, Allison Carter is leading the next project that uh, I've been on since 2019. I'm a co-director with her on Patea, Cambodia, and we're working bottom bottom to try to understand provincial centers. But it's very hard. It's very hard to figure out what is the catchment, where did people live? So we're working around this little temple, it's very nice. It's called Prasat Basai. And then we're moving out from there to try to understand residential patterning out there. Even if we're able to do that, which we think we'll be able to do, we won't be able to model population for the province, right? So it takes work in all of these areas. And as a contrast, you could look at say uh, areas, um, there's an there's a ancient empire called Tiwanaku, which is in the Andes in South America, especially in Bolivia. Um, and archaeologists have been working there, very detailed work, all kinds of work, and the remote sensing and the surveys and the excavations um, for 50 years also, but many more of them. 
And they also have a really hard time modeling population. The only place where archaeologists have been able to model populations that is urban, um, where I've seen it very successfully, seems to be in Mesoamerica. And the only problem there is where they can model it, like in the Maya area, they're very small urban centers. So uh, we're, we're far from being able to do that yet. Now, in terms of the importance of Angkor for Southeast Asia, uh, I would argue that actually it was the earlier so-called cities that mattered uh, because each place where you see larger settlements later, it's not just the Mekong Basin. You can look in Myanmar, you can look in the Chao Phraya in Thailand, uh, and you can look in Northern Vietnam, of course. Uh, what you see is you have a preceding urban template. Northern Vietnam is different. I'll give you that because it was Sinicized, uh, you know, by a thousand years of Chinese hegemony and so on. Um, that's what the Vietnamese tell me. But if you look, for example, at Bagan in Myanmar, uh, before you have Bagan, you have these big sites that are called Pew sites. Right? And those sites probably became less important, even if they were still occupied by the eighth century. That some have occupation after that. Sometimes you have Pew occupation and then you have Bagan on top of it. Right? So you see that. Then in the Chao Phraya Basin, you have these Devaravati sites. And people don't like to talk about Dvaravati so much as they like to talk about Ayutthaya, or they talk about Zukotai, right? But before all that, you have what really is the earliest Thai urbanism, maybe by non-Thai speakers, but Thai urbanism. So I would say that the, import, the importance is that first millennium kind of layer of population aggregation, which you could call urbanism. But insofar as Angkor having influence, I would also say that Angkor had influence not simply through its urbanism, but through its statecraft. And that echoed through at least Thailand and Laos, um, maybe not so many other areas. But it is the case, we think, that Ayutthaya not only hauled off people and uh, artisans and artists and dancers when they pillaged or sacked Angkor, um, but they also adopted a lot of notions of how to be a state. It's a little hard to pull it apart. Um, people who work in Thailand, particularly uh, archaeologists and art historians, often say that Khmer uh, was spoken, it was a lingua franca in Ayutthaya before the so-called sacking. There may have been Khmer people living there, just as there probably were Khmer and Korean people living in the Cham areas in central Vietnam. So it's hard to pull it all apart, right? Um, but when I talk to art historians and I read their work and here I'm talking about Ashley Thompson and I'm also talking actually about an up and coming PhD student, Peapod Kratje Jun, who's at SOAS right now and others, they talk about this kind of echo of Encore, right? So even after the sack of Encore or the decline of Encore, whatever you like to call it, there are these notions of Angkorian ideology that continue so that when you go to Ayutthaya, when you go to central Thailand and then to Ayutthaya in particular, and even to Sukhothai, you can see these kinds of influences that were from the Angkorian world. So whether or not people were speaking Khmer in the 1600s in Ayutthaya, which I don't know about, um, they definitely were speaking Khmer and they had very similar kinds of religious practices early on. So, so yes, Angkor had this longer influence, maybe not as a template for a city. I mean, no one's ever really asked me that before. I think it's a great question. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the Angkorian metropolis was a one-off for Southeast Asia until now, because <laughs> now we have mega cities. Uh, and it was a mega city in a largely rural landscape. I hope that's helpful. So we're starting to run a little low on time. So I'm okay. gonna, so there's actually two parts of uh, the questions from Michelle. So I'm gonna give you both of those and then okay. we'll do the last ones all together. Um, so Michelle asked, in terms of economy, was there export of products such as iron or pottery or was it turned out to be, the, and, and, or was it turned to meeting the needs of the empire? Uh, international or centered on itself? And then the second part, which is she asked later is, uh, was, was, is in regard to the absence of records. And she was asking whether it was due to using palm leaves to compile them or paper books that were destroyed or other reasons. Oh, so the first part is, um, is a little complex to answer because 
uh, Sukhothai was export oriented. If you're an archeologist, you know about the Sisachana like kilns, so Angkor like kilns. Uh, and so there's been a long tendency to imagine that Angkor was somehow our hermit empire, which we don't think at all based on excavating and, and working as archeologists. But we do think that um, the notion of export was very different. So uh, all of the ceramics uh, are found within areas where people who are associated with the Angkorian state lived, even if it's Western Thailand. We never find them on shipwrecks. We have 12th century and 11th century, 9th and 10th century shipwrecks. We never find Angkorian material. We also think that all the iron production was probably gobbled up by the state. Um, that being said, we have Chinese records, uh, especially Song, but before that, especially Song uh, and Yuan records of emissaries going back and forth. So, so we don't think that Angkor had an export-oriented economy the way that Sukhothai later did. But we know that goods were moving out of the Mekong Basin and they were going to China and vice versa. In fact, one of the most interesting parts about this is that for the longest time, I mean, archaeological time, uh, uh, the, the ceramics from China that were coming in were coming in through emissarial missions. So they were all coming not through trade, they were coming as gifts. Um, and then there's a shift during the Song where China goes very mercantile. And at that point, we think there were traders coming in and there's an influx, not only in Angkor, but also in Java, Jan Wisman Christie's work suggests that um, with big trading ports and so on. So the answer is uh, not really export the way we think of export. And the second part was what again? Having to do with the uh, records with- um... Oh, right, sorry, uh, yeah. We think there were lots and lots and lots of records. And I say that because uh, the Chinese in the third and the sixth century with Funan talked about libraries. They talked then about libraries. Now, I don't see how people would go from being literate to illiterate, um, but there is the issue of preservation. So it's kind of like uh, what would preserve from the United States. You know, you're gonna miss, you might get some billboards. You're gonna get your historical register inscriptions and in metal and you'll lose your books, right? So there's a lot that we know isn't there. And in some cases, we have hints because the Chinese and some of the inscriptions, Sadok Kok Tom and the others, um, either in, in inscriptions like Sadok Kok Tom, they talk about histories. And then the Chinese talk about histories. So there are histories, and those histories are repeated through time, but we don't have very many intact records. So yes, we think part of it was perishable goods. We think they were highly literate. By the way. Great. Okay, so I'm going to just, since we're low on time, I'm just going to read you the three last uh, questions. <laughs> it, it's, it's very interesting talk you gave. So it's, we're getting lots of really great, great questions. Um, so uh, first is from C. Bore again, and it's, is there any evidence uh, point, that were, points out who played an important role in, Anchorians, in, in the Anchorian city planning? Um, question one. Yeah. Question two. Um, thank you, Dr. Barium. How do you see, and this is from Kim, how, how do you see the implication of Angkor urbanism relevant to the present day context of modern urbanized society where uncontrolled expansion of the world's population and environmental deg degradation? How do you see this study of urbanization in relation to Angkor helping to establish sustainable urban development in Cambodia, especially in present day Siem Reap? That's the second question. Uh -huh. uh, so then the third is Ajahn from uh, Sri Ratana uh, Ajahn Mariam. How do you see the relationship of Angkor relevant to Thailand, especially the border area of, in the Dunkirk in the Dunkirk range? Okay, uh, city planners. Uh, well, first of all, we know that there was a grid put in. Um, I believe it was in the 11th century, is the best we can reckon, and. We don't know anything, but what we think we know <laughs> is that there are a series of sastras of um, texts from South Asia that guided everything from how you would create and build a temple uh, to how you would lay out a city. Not, and we, we're not saying they're Indians who came over, but in some cases, I've been told by South Asian specialist colleagues of mine <laughs> that the Angkorians were more uh, faithful to the sastras dictates that you see in text that Stella Craig Grish talks about with the Hindu temple than Indians were at the time. So we do know that and we do, and we know that uh, the courts had 
priests and they had knowledgeable, they, they had these, these wise men, these scholars, they not only taught the rulers kids, but they also helped guide uh, rituals. And so we think there were city, I, I'm going to say, I think there were city planners. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that and I can't see them archaeologically, but it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, what does Angkor tell us about urbanism? Well, actually, uh, people are increasingly talking about Angkor as a, as a case study in either resilience or overshoot, depending on who you talk to. People who like to use these catastrophic models of collapse say that Angkor collapsed, but then the archaeologists go back and say, well, actually, there isn't one point of collapse. You can see this slow just depopulation, but you can see different areas being populated. You can see reorganization through time. So it depends on who you are. Definitely, uh, there are issues with water and CM rib, and I'm not a hydrologist, so I can't speak to that. But looking at sustainability and looking at scale, uh, during the history of Angkor, certainly the more sustainable scale was smaller than seven, 900,000 people. And so people are starting to use Angkor when they talk about long-term resilience and the structure of urbanism. So Roland Fletcher has used this term, low density urbanism. Uh, which has some drawbacks, but there's some logic to it in tropical areas and arguing that in the tropics, uh, you can see a kind of sustained occupation of areas when it's at lower densities, um, but that that kind of intense um, packing, we call it urban packing, I guess, that that is not sustainable. So there can be lessons, uh, certainly urban planners should talk with archaeologists. We shouldn't be telling them what to do exactly about that. Uh, but we think that there needs to be more discussion because we have these very long histories of cities. So when I teach origin of cities, we talk about cities that may have risen and collapsed and been rebuilt over 800 years or 1,000 years. London is a great example. It was Londinium during the Roman period. And so it goes on. And so anytime there's excavation done for the tube there, Archaeologists have to go down, I don't know, 10 meters maybe, and they go through a couple thousand years of, of debris. So, uh, so anyway, cities have these long histories and there are certain lessons to be learned. And then finally, to wrap it up very quickly, um, what can I say about the Donrex? I, I think they're fascinating. I think that we need much more settlement work done on both sides. And I think that um, the more collaboration between people working in Thailand and Cambodia, the better, because this, these are nation state boundaries, and I, I don't mean to offend anyone here, but these are pretty contemporary nation state boundaries. Um, and north of the Donrex, people were reckoned that they were part of the Angkorian world. I mean, it's very clear in Buri Ram and Sarin. It's not just that you call it Khmer Sarin, it's that the temples are there, right? And the pottery is there. And so, and there are Khmer speakers. And, and there's other, you know, there's lots of Lao speakers too because of more recent kinds of um, migrations and relocations. Um, but we definitely need to work more. And I, I find it very uh, inspiring that there have been, I've been able to bring Thai crew members sometimes to work in Cambodia. And I think, and also I should point out that um, Imsokriti has had a phenomenal collaboration on uh, a living Angkor Road project for, I don't know, more than 15 years maybe with colleagues in Thailand. And that's the kind of work we really need to do across the borders. It's great. It's, uh, it's uh, informative, it's, it's dynamic and it, and it energizes everyone. So it makes us think differently about boundaries, which is useful. So thank you, Miriam. Um, we are out of time. Um, there was one more question that came in from Sopeep, but I think what, what I can do is put you in touch with him um, and, and you can talk to him then directly <laughs> if it is, uh, since we are actually just about to go um, over time here. I just wanted to thank our audience as well for really, really great questions and participation and um, and I wanted to also let you know that we have another talk uh, coming up on January 28th. Um, this is part of a, a new um, special Cambodia seminar series that's being organized by, by us and also with the New York Southeast Asia Network and also with the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. And our special guest um, for the, it's going to be the inaugural event is going to be Linda Sapan. Um, some of you will be familiar with her work. Um, Linda, uh, sorry, Dr. Sapan's talk is called the Cambodia's Golden Age Voices Legacy. 
and she examines the lyrics of popular songs from 1953 to 1975. And this talk will be moderated by Duncan McCargo from the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. And um, information about the time and for signing up for that can be found on our website and our social media. And if you receive um, our newsletter and our mailings. Um, so thank you very much once again, Miriam, and thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.